Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Get out your white beats and your black contacts. It's mm -hmm. time for double feature. You know, I promise you, this is my last week of my South African musical obsession. Yeah. This is it. I'm only giving myself one more week for it, then I'm going to snap back to reality. Okay. Uh, before, uh, my, I'm Eric, by the way. Oh, and, hey. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Eric. Oh, my name is uh, Michael. I will fuck you in the ass. <laughs> I guess, white boy. I'm sorry, what? Sorry. Oh, Jesus. Thanks for throwing me off on the intro. I don't even know what's happening right now. Two films, double feature. Right, right, right. But while we're spending uh, one more week in fantasy, what are the movies we're going to do? Uh, wow, good one. You um, like that? We're going to do The Ward, uh -huh. and then we're going to do Darkon. So this is uh, Make Me Think I'm Not Crazier Than Everyone Else, double yeah. feature. This is just bringing Eric back into normality. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. I We've appreciate that. We've been spending that. a lot of time with crazy people this year on mm -hmm. double feature. Um. And that's just me and you sitting watching the films, right. but also in the films, right, right. Uh, there have been a lot of crazy people. Yeah, so we're going to make the crazy a little bit more normal today, or yeah. maybe we won't. We'll find out. But uh, in doing that, we're going to spoil both of the movies. Got to spoil them. Yeah, you pretty much have to spoil the movies. If it's double feature, it must be spoiled. Uh, the thing I love about spoiling the movies is we don't have to do it at all, but yeah. it's our show, so fuck you. Use the chapters. We give you chapters. We put up a big middle finger... And then we say, but there's chapters. Right. And then no one uses the chapters. They just spoil themselves. <laughs> Why do you do this? Skip the movie that you haven't seen. The ward's coming up first. I'm yep. going to spoil part of our show right now. It's going to happen first. <laughs> you can skip it with a fucking chapter. You can go right to Darkon, which you'll never see anyway. Yeah, you it's haven't a documentary. seen it. It's really difficult to spoil Darkon. Yeah. Um, we've already told you that it's a movie. That's a pretty heavy spoiler. Yeah, um, right. So then after that, we're going to go right to the end to talk about... Uh, Movies we're doing next time. What is The Ward? Why Why is that on the show? What is this thing today? Um, well, The Ward is a film by John Carpenter. Whoa, there's still John Carpenter movies we haven't done. Uh, there's there's a lot. How and, is this um, possible? I say this every time. The Ward is actually kind of this, uh, it's his, it's, it's, he did it, uh, this is what, his second comeback film? Yeah. Um, it's the first film he did since Ghosts of Mars. Finally a glimpse of this new John Carpenter we keep referencing <laughs> right. but not uh, actually discussing on the show. Yeah, and, and we've missed out on a lot of John Carpenter. We've kind of artfully dodged the 90s sure. of John Carpenter, with the exception of Escape from L.A. For now. Um, but there's a large portion of John Carpenter's career where he spiraled into obscurity and everybody started hating everything he did. Sure. Um. He did that Vampires movie with James Woods. Oh, yeah. And uh, he did, I mean, he did uh, In the Mouth of Madness. Sure. He did all these movies in the 90s that everybody hated and were absolute critical failures and box office failures. And then he did The Ghost of Mars, which unlike the previous films, everybody hated it and it was a box office failure. And so now we have The Ward. <laughs> uh. So The Ward is, I mean, it's a definitive return to horror. Yeah. The Ghost of Mars is still is John Carpenter dabbling in his sci-fi horror thing sure, that we sure. saw with uh, Dark Star because that was right. terrifying. Right. But the Ward is just it's where horror lives in a fucking mental institution with Amber Heard and Jared Harris. I'm sorry, it's an asylum, sir. Yeah. You don't call a place like this an institution. It's true. One flew over the cuckoo's nest was in an institution. <laughs> this is an asylum. Fair enough. It's a sanitarium. Yeah. Yeah. Sanitarium. It's really man. That's <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Um, so the ward, it, it's not, not written by John Carpenter. Mm -hmm. It's not scored by John Carpenter, yeah. but it is directed by John Carpenter. Sure. And it still looks like it came out in the late seventies. Man, I, you know, when the movie opens, I'm feeling the way John Carpenter films in yeah, the seventies. Right. But I'm a little surprised by how modern it looks. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's definitely, you know, it's a movie from today. Yeah. But the kind of technique and just, you know, the camera's low to the ground. There's these incredibly still setups, sure. um, the all lightning stuff, coming in. Yeah, all stuff that John Carpenter's done. It's yeah, all John right, Carpenter's right. stuff. But then moves directly into this smashed glass kind right. of intro. You know, this, uh, it's a glimpse into the things that he was doing in Halloween. But this is, I would say, probably the most stylized Carpenter movie yet. 
well, I mean, that so I've seen. The thing, the thing is, and and I'm under the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that you haven't seen the Ghosts of Mars. That's true. So the Ghosts of Mars is similarly stylized in mm. that it just looks like it was made in the 70s. I don't right. think John Carpenter has ever made a movie that looks like it came out after 1982. See, I don't know. I feel like this looks modern. I mean, do you? See, it's I feel the technique like, that makes it look 70s to me. Yeah, well, but that's what I mean. I don't know if it's a I don't it's know if the it's chief an intentional yeah. I don't know if it's an intentional aesthetic to give it kind of a vintage look or if that is really just how I think it's who he is, man. Yeah. I think that's, <laughs> that's how John Carpenter makes his movies, yeah. which brings me to this this thing that we 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 touched on in Dark Star about how a certain filmmaker may have ripped a certain sci-fi saga sure. off of Dark Star. We talked about Star Wars and Dark Star. <laughs> um, and when you see this kind of vintage um, style, I mean, Black Dynamite, you know, where it looks like it's the 70s, but it's clearly a modern film. Uh, Black Dynamite does it to the nth degree and far more intentionally. Right. But we see this thing in the ward where... I start thinking everybody's just been ripping off John Carpenter for years. Well, yeah, that's the thing is you watch a modern John Carpenter movie right? and you go, oh, yeah, all these things I've been seeing suddenly now. That's what I mean when I say it looks modern. Sure. This is a sudden wake up call to me to go, oh, these techniques. Oh, yeah. yes, I have seen these uh -huh. before. Where there, There's things that I will watch in a film now that comes out and go, oh, yeah, that's an interest. Mm, I like how you're. It, yep. The lighting is all really gray, and sure. and everything is kind of this wan, pale, slow right. paced sure. thing. But it, you know, there's still a really yep. gritty, pulsing heartbeat sure. behind everything. Sure. Yeah, that's an inter that's fucking that's John pulse, Carpenter man. since 1979. Yep, it is. It is. And it's things we talked about in those movies, but I guess yeah. we never really took time to consider... Bringing them into a modern setting, because neither did John Carpenter. Well, <laughs> I was going to say the influence they've had on the modern setting. Yeah. Because we see this pulse all the time. Yeah. We see the influence John Carpenter had on so many different people, sure. and we never really stopped to consider, oh yeah, this seems very... I mean, maybe we do all the time. I don't know. It seems like we're constantly uh -huh. bringing up John Carpenter. But so many of these filmmakers in horror probably cite Carpenter as one of their major influences. Oh, yeah. And when you see him in a modern setting doing his thing, suddenly you're pointing at all these different scenes and going, oh, the pace here, the setting here, right. how these scenes are directed, you know, how he's cutting from one thing to another. You're finding out how John Carpenter has influenced the modern world by seeing his stuff brought up to speed that way. Well, and then we get the obvious distinction where there is no Carpenter score. And I think that yeah. takes me very quickly out of the typical... Uh, I always think of The Fog when I think of the John Carpenter setup for a film. Sure. Because I don't know if you remember in The Fog, the film opens on a single synthesizer note from a Casio keyboard <laughs> with varying clips of a port town i don't have to remember because they all do that <laughs> yeah um but yeah i know what you mean there's but, a creature from the fog in the ward does that that's help true um but the ward opens with this kind of i mean they establish the sanitarium um they do the slow panning down the hallway yeah, right they set up this in it it's scary as fuck yeah it is. it's amazing to see john carpenter go these were my tech because we're you know we're younger we never saw we didn't see halloween when it came out right we didn't see, I didn't, I don't even honestly don't remember if I'd seen Halloween since before I'd seen the remake. Oh yeah. Um, Rob Zombie's doing something quick, find right? out what it is. Exactly. And sound like, you know what you're talking That's about. That's why I love hockey now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but well, uh, so the first Halloween, I mean, you remember the opening shot in there sure. being that long camera track and yeah. you know, that's totally the, uh, I mean, it's kind of a version of how we're opening this. Sure. Um, it's a little lower to the ground, but it's still long, right. single tracking before we move around a bit. And and people always talk about how, oh my God, Halloween was so scary when it came out. And I'm like, yeah, well, you didn't see the movies I've seen. Ha, ha, ha. The ward is terrifying. <laughs> it's horrifying, and it's amazing to see John Carpenter go, these are my techniques in 2011. Right. This is why people were scared of my movies. Right. Because my techniques make you uncomfortable. And the longer you dwell on something, sure. and the slower the pace becomes, sure. the you know the heartbeat of the film starts pounding in your brain, and right, you're constantly right. going, "Where is what 
coming from. Right. That's why when Alice starts showing up, yeah. even though Alice doesn't look scary, it's just the way Alice is portrayed and the little things, the things under her skin. Sure. Nothing is comfortable. Right. But it's not uncomfortable because the camera's doing something dramatic. It's not uncomfortable mm-hmm. because the camera's using weird angles or moving shaky, you know, the shutter stuff from 28 weeks later where you're yeah. unsettled, but you can't tell why. Right. right. John Carpenter makes you unsettled by going, no, everything's probably okay. <laughs> right. I mean, if you've ever, I don't know if right. you've ever even heard John Carpenter do like commentary. Oh no! Is it, that how he does it? So, oh, that's he's, perfect. Yeah, in this scene, um, one of the things we really tried to do was kind of capture the the dimness of this hallway because I feel like um, a hallway like this really kind of embodies a sense of danger and horror and you know brutal violence. So <laughs> it's <laughs> amazing. Oh man, I'm gonna take a weekend and just fucking watch all of his films with commentary. That's great. It's rare we get to see, um, and this is going to sound awful after just seeing this kind of with the faculty, but seeing somebody so well-known for something, so divorced from their elements. Yeah. Uh, John Carpenter's just directing this. He didn't write it. He right. didn't do the sound. When I think John Carpenter, I think sound because sure. of the jokes we right. make on this show. <laughs> but I mean... Sometimes writing, too. Yeah. The writing stuff, you know, some of his most famous films he wrote. Yeah. And... You look at the sound, and as much as we laugh about it, that is... I mean, I don't need to talk about this. We've talked about yeah. it to death. The sound makes John Carpenter work. It does. And so now we have... It's, a, again, great experiment, great case study. Sure. Let's have John Carpenter direct something and just see what other people do. Yeah. With his, it's almost a cover album. Yeah. You know? it's, it's true. Yeah. That's what a do good other people do it. when they look at John Carpenter and then add score to it? Yeah, or, you know, how does that play out? And I think it tells us not only about him as a director, mm-hmm. but it tells us just as much about him as a writer and sure. a composer from what's not in this movie, you know, as it does about what, what does his direction look like if you separate these other things. Right. That's a great thing you can do to learn more about someone's visual style is just, you know, turn off the sound uh-huh. and just force yourself to focus on, all right, a horror movie like this, where are the scares coming from? When it's subtitles and no score. Right. You know, the jumps are obviously a lot different, but you find totally different parts of the movie frightening than you you normally would. So, okay, before we get to the kill room, because the kill room is going to lead me to a very different place. Sure. There's multiple personalities in this movie. And I think that the kill room is the most obvious moment where you can see that. Because where the fuck is this room? How do these girls get there? But they all die there. (laughs) Right. Um, Right. So the film deals with multiple personalities in a horror in a horror context from a clinical standpoint. Mm-hmm. Eric, I'm gonna say I like it. I'm gonna say I, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go out and I'm just gonna Michael say Michael Kester is okay with it. I'm gonna say and I mean um, I'm not I'm not gonna pretend that it's not because how it's does, John Carpenter. How does Tyler Durden feel about that <laughs> verdict? Well, see the the thing that I feel about. Um, the ward is that once the multiple personalities thing drops mm-hmm. and if you didn't figure it out already, uh, I mean, you must've been asleep, but if you didn't figure <laughs> right. it out already, that isn't the end of it. Sure. It's kind of this twist reveal, but it goes to point out this really cool psychological thing about defense mechanisms in horrific sure. situations sure. and compartmentalizing your fears. Sure. And I, I feel like if anybody is going to do a psychological case study on how to handle right. utter terror. Right. I want to watch John Carpenter do it. Sure. The other thing that I think was really ballsy is when all the multiple personalities are dispelled, it mm-hmm. wasn't Amber Heard laying in the bed. Yeah, right. To to go, no, you just came in. You aren't really, right. you were never here. <laughs> right. You are as new to the film as the audience. Sure. Everybody who's in this ward They've been here, but they're also not real. Yeah. Everybody that we watch in the entire film isn't even there. Sure, sure. That's the kind of fascinating part of the movie is because you get multiple personalities. You get fucking, what was it, Manhunt 2? Yeah. Stuff where they they deal in maybe the idea of multiple personalities. Mm -hmm. And um, you never really get something where at the end game... You're just watching the personalities. Sure. You're not watching the real human being 
dealing with their demons. Sure. You're solely watching the demons get weeded out. Sure, right. Yeah. By, by acting them off one at a time. Sure. By you're watching reality pick them off. You're watching the insane elements of the human sure. mind get therapied to death. Well, it's also a way that they can take the horror convention of these cliche characters and then yeah. try and justify it. Right. To go, oh yeah, we have the childish one and we have, you know, the, what is it? Uh, the id, the artist, the yeah. seductress. There's right. the TiVo moment sure. where you go, oh, that's all the characters written on the, you know, the paper, uh-huh. um, the infant and so forth. And yeah, we get that it's the infant and the seductress and they're written paper thin. And then when we find out multiple personalities, oh, that's why they're yeah. written like that. It's not because the movie's scary and therefore there's no dimensionality right. to the characters. It's because we're seeing one character divided strewn out on yeah. over all these people. Yeah. And I think that that's a really okay way to do multiple personalities. <laughs> the only way that I think would make it completely acceptable is if they come out of the gate going multiple personalities. Sure. You know, they come out of the, and maybe maybe make it seem like Amber Heard's character is the rock and everybody sure. else isn't real. You know, I like that idea for an approach too, yeah. though. I wonder how uh, different this movie would be if you just revealed to everyone else that it was multiple personalities right from the get go. Yeah. That's the, um, the effect you then have watching this again. Sure. And seeing right. how these interactions go. Well, and I'm always of the idea that if you're going to make a twist on a movie, that's dumb. Don't. And just <laughs> sure. try something new and, Expli- say the twist right off the bat. Yeah, right. And and let people say the twist and then shoot the film as if you didn't. Yeah. And then instead of surprising people with it at the end, let people try to figure out why you're shooting things weird. Sure, sure. So the girls are one thing it centers around, but the other part of all those personalities would be Alice, then, mm-hmm. who is, I mean, she drives the mystery in sure. uh, in this movie. We have all these personalities clashing against each other, and then we have the one thing that's kind of, you know, the catalyst for that. Right. Uh, or what we would think is the catalyst before we get that reveal and sure. kind of learn what's actually happening there. But they have this kind of group secret that I like, that it seems like everybody but Amber Heard's character is uh-huh. in on. Um, Zoe's even fucking in on it, yeah. being so the outsider, almost the... I mean, she represents innocence, but also this kind of naive you know sure. just uh she's she's still corruptible she yeah. still plays her part in what happens but um she also has the one joke in the entire movie <laughs> uh which is in the elevator where she goes he's really mad which yeah. is just i love that too just straight out horror movie scary one good joke yeah this should be a precedent we set but it's sorry anyways uh but then there's alice who's driving the mystery sure. And we know the thing attacking is Alice right away. Right. That's, you know, that's another thing that horror movies will often do is kind of go, oh, what's the thing going to be? Uh-huh. And no, it's Alice. We know it's Alice from the opening scene. But we start getting these little details. You know, Sarah's strapped down and calls out Alice's name. And so we know that Sarah knows who Alice is. Uh-huh. We see her skin kind of crawl, like there's maggots or something moving uh-huh. underneath, so some kind of supernatural element right. or something dead. Or uh, She starts by appearing in darkness, like that's a rule, mm-hmm. like we're thinking about supernatural monster rules. But eventually, she's appearing in the middle of the yep. fucking day. It's, uh, it's similar to the problem we faced in 28 Weeks Later, where the scares could come at any time. Yeah. She can, you know, materialize through a fucking dumbwaiter. I mean, nowhere is safe. <laughs> they're, uh, they're just, uh, they're saying gloves are off with everything. And so we're kind of figuring out who Alice is. Right. So that we know what to be afraid of and what the rules of being afraid of that thing are supposed to be. Well, and that brings me back to the whole, that kill room where mm-hmm. it's, the, a lot of the film is, you know, it's dialogue and discovery and searching and, David Robert Jones trying to uh, therapy, you know, your demons away. Right. right. And then um, looking so much healthier, so much healthier. (laughs) Um, But then we have this kill room where these horrific acts of violence (laughs) take place. Yep. And um, it's amazing because, again, seeing mostly John Carpenter films from the early 80s, you know, 
I've never gotten a chance to see what John Carpenter's comfort level with violence is yeah. in a modern setting. Sure. And apparently it's a giant spike <laughs> right. lobotomizing you. Sure. Well, there's a lot of this that starts to feel like hostile. That yeah. starts to feel like a reaction to that stuff. And it would be very easy for one of the old timers to come in and say, ah, oh, these new kids with their horror porn and their yeah, uh, movies exactly. are so terrible today. John Carpenter shows up and goes, Oh yeah, you guys are slaughtering people now. Cool, I can do that. Yeah, I'm into that. You know, it's kind of adapting to his setting. It's one of those things that makes me question. You know, I like the idea of John Carpenter as a guy who lives in a capsule, uh -huh. lives in the woods, and is not aware that it is no longer 1978. Right. But then he shows up in this movie, and you know, maybe it's studio stipulation or it's what's written in or whatever. But he directs it like it's fucking second nature yeah. for him. You know, he just goes, "Oh, this is horror now, and I'm the horror guy." So yep. let's do this. Stab their eyes. And then you get this moment in the film right at the end where the multiple personality gets told it's a multiple personality. Sure. And she starts going, no, I'm, I'm, wait, I don't remember anything. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. What did I do before I got here? Oh, crap. And you're right. She starts seeing her face being Alice's face in right, her memories. Right. And it's almost this fantastic moment where she goes, I've never existed. And then yeah. right about the time that the film would have to start doing some really meta weird shit, Alice tackles her out a window, just like in Halloween. Yep. And that's how you wrap that up. Well, that's great, too, because as you're getting this heavy handed explanation and it's yeah. the, the will the audience buy it moments, uh, we also realize, you know what? The monster in this movie has only gone down once and this is still a horror film. So what the reveal actually means is that the monster is still alive. Yeah. Um, there's no monsters in Darkon. Maybe personal demons. Let's talk about... Uh, <laughs> this is a film, in case people didn't watch this, because it's a fucking documentary, and you assholes skip the documentaries all the time, don't you? Don't you? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe everybody watches the documentaries. Every time, without fail, they're some of my favorite movies we do on the show. Oh, I know. They're great. Because... They're all great. Think well, about fucking all of them. Actors are so boring. Yeah, fuck you, actors. I mean, actors and writing? God, what a boring way to put a story together. <laughs> you want to do something interesting? Go out with a camera and film real people being real people. Oh, you know, man. you film fucking Billy Mitchell for 15 minutes. Yep. I will laugh harder than any... Sure, sure. Judd Apatow, Seth MacFarlane, <laughs> haha, funny teddy bear oh, God. thing. Well, and this movie does that hybrid thing, yeah. right? It does, well, let's uh, let's do the charming task of holding these people up as if they're actually in the the thing they're doing. This is a movie about a medieval game, yeah. right? Uh, the kind of a role-playing game that people play and that they are, I mean, they are really immersed in. It becomes one of the most important, if not the most important part of their lives, if not their whole life. Right. And we uh, we start the documentary with a very theatrical opening. You know, people are in full costume. We give them a time to shine right away. We have the, and this is something we do at a lot of points in the movie. Um, there's there's the music, there's the dramatic angles and the confident editing. Even though these people aren't professional actors, when they're doing their role playing, mm -hmm. we edit it together like they aren't delivering their lines, like yeah. they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Some of them are really good at it and some of them are terrible at it. But the movie just keeps moving as if we accidentally put in a bad take and yeah. the editor was not aware of it. We just keep confidently marching through. And, you know, that shows how far you can sell something with camera work, how far the the smooth moving camera can make it feel like a real epic fantasy film. Yeah. Uh, helicopter shots or the... Uh, the Citadel of Peace at yeah. the end, the way they shoot that, it's a fucking cardboard castle. And, you know, you film it with a sweeping crane shot and you're really, I mean, you're totally in. So this does, as far as I can tell, two things. It, first of all, it's nice of them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a nice thing the filmmakers do. It's a little present they give. These guys in the movie fantasize about something they can never truly be. Sure. And I'm not talking about... Oh, you and I could be president, but yeah. not really we could be president. Right. I mean, we could never fucking be elves. Yeah. That is not a thing yeah. that will ever happen. That's true. Ever. But the movie comes along and it lets them be elves. You know what yeah. I mean? It gives them this rare opportunity. But I think more importantly, what it does is pull you as the audience over to their side a bit. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the mere fact this is, it's like when we talked about Crash, 
whether or not Cronenberg knows he's doing a really fucking sure. weird thing. The, the very nature of you have a film about this means you know it's an oddity, mm-hmm. and then you have to try desperately to humanize that oddity. So it, it has an audience that's going, uh-oh, weird role-playing people. Yeah. You know, and they address that in the movie, how the normal sure. people treat them. So the movie has to kind of go, oh, we're going to be on their side. Here's what it's like. It gives you a sense of, well, this is why these people, this is what it looks like in their heads. Right. This is why we're doing that. It puts you in their shoes. And I mean, that's hard for me because I have no, I'm not a fantasy guy. I have no medieval background. (laughs) I dated a wench at medieval times for a while, Uh but that was really about the extent of it. I'm the kind of asshole who always wants to show up to the Ren Fair as a robot. That I've been like plotting that idea. for years. <laughs> sounds like a great idea. I want to show up in an Iron Man suit, is go. basically. But, you know, I'm watching this, and from the, from the fucking opening, yeah, I'm hooked. Sure. I'm, I'm into it. I get what they're doing. Well, and the other thing that I love about the film is uh, we talked about uh, King of Kong. We always bring up King of Kong whenever we do a documentary. because Total opposite. You yeah. and I can chuck quarters in a machine all day. Yeah. We know how that works. But the King of Kong documentary, they're clearly kind of making fun of them. Um, they're, they're patting them on the back. They're heroes in their own right, but right. But there's no attempt to make us feel like we kind of get what they're right. And in a global sense, they're kind of cutting them off and going, these people are weirdos with sure. heroes within their yeah. ilk. Also, you know, I mean, championing them, sure, but yeah. it's telling a, a story about yeah, weirdos. It's whereas dark makes no attempt to make any satire or parody of these people right it doesn't necessarily say look how cool they are look sure, how normal sure. they are but what it does do is back the fuck off yeah right and turn the camera on sure sure um if you were in the king of kong and you made a joke about how they're all nerds it would be well received sure if you were in this movie and you made a joke about it they would kick you out of their camp sure you know what i mean that would not be cool right Well, and that's kind of what they all talk about in the beginning of the film. And a lot of that is really powerful where they talk about the dark on world versus the real world. And some of it is what you'd expect. It's, oh, I'm, I can't get a girlfriend. So now I'm a mage. Poor cardboard. Oh, poor cardboard. God. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's typically what I expect is you get these people who have kind of shitty living situations. They're Mm -hmm. not perfectly good socially, but in a fantasy world, they're the king of their own castle. Sure, yeah. Literally. Yeah. Um, and that's said oftentimes sure. about role-playing games, about video games, about but, a lot of that stuff. But the thing that gets said that I love is when that one woman's talking about how she's a textile buyer for a right, fabric right. company. Sure. And she's she's like, well, and if, if I don't do my job right, then someone shows up and they don't have the right amount of fabric for their shirt. Basically, I have no impact on right. the real world. Yeah, sure. And I don't like that. Sure. If I didn't show up to work one day, someone would be disappointed. But really, on a global scale, nothing would change. Honestly, that's, that's... why I like Darkon. Yeah. Because I, it can affect the world around me. Sure. And I, I mean, love that. No matter what you do for a living, unless you're one of about 20 people, then what you do in, in the grand scale doesn't right. really. I don't want to say it doesn't matter. Because it matters. Sure. But the world's not going to end. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't have that epic. We're not counting on you to make me that goddamn latte. Yeah. (laughs) Well, if you phone it in at your job, somebody has an inconvenience. And that's usually what happens. And I mean, that's not true of people who work in medicine. And it's not true of, well, I guess even if you develop like biotech. Yeah. Still, your failure just means that something gets made a little slower. Right. We don't get a breakthrough. Well, I feel like there's very few people who don't go, ah, something rather inconsequential sure. will happen. Right. Not to trivialize what they do, yeah. but it's not the same as an outcome of an epic battle that determines how everybody lives sure. their day-to-day life based on what, you know, what faction they, what regime they're now under. You right. Know? Well, and the obvious rationale for that, despite just the, yeah, it's medieval times and everything is big, is that it's a small universe. Yeah. It's a tiny little sect. So, I mean, just by sheer percentage, if you die, that's probably almost, you know, nearly a whole number percentage of <laughs> sure. the population of sure. Darkon. Yeah, right, right. Um, so I think that's the best way to look at it is I, you know, I'm successful at my job. I do a thing that's kind of important. But my long-term decisions are not life or death. And so I want to up the stakes, so I play Darkon. Yeah. There's another idea that's brought up. 
and I'm curious what you think about it. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a thought posed early in the movie um, through the voiceover. I think Baron says it, and it's an idea that Frank Miller toyed with in Sin City, which is just that you were born in the wrong time. Uh huh. That you have these skills that you know you are very skilled at something, but you were just you know you'd be better suited in another age. It's what Frank says about Marv. That, uh, you know, it's Dwight who says that line. Yeah. That he would have been right at home with the gladiators, but now he's a burnout in a bar. Is there any truth to that, or is that just a fucking excuse? Yeah, I don't know. I think that, I think that a lot of people are in tune with different parts of society, and I think that the way that society works is there's a rise and fall of what's really important socially, sure. or artistically, or creatively, or professionally. Right. Um. Do you really feel like you could transplant these people back centuries ago and that they'd be uh, oh, better off? Oh, no, no, off? no. So the, the, the but to what I'm saying uh -oh. is I don't think that any of these people <laughs> would transplant back to a medieval age. Okay. Even a little. Sure. Probably 1984. You think so? That's when they would flourish because okay. that's when, when dorky, weird people were the, the kings. Look at the club kids. <laughs> Okay. You know, these people are the club kids circa 2008. Right. Well, they were the kings, but they were the kings of a subculture. Yeah. <laughs> so still not still not world leaders. Sure, but the, but... the, the universe is... Well, I don't think that there's ever a transplant to be a world leader. I yeah. think that, okay. that whoever, is leading the, whoever is leading the fucking people leading... They're fucking beige as shit. Yeah, like, right. The Lowest only common way, denominator yeah, always The only wins. way to lead... The, the, the leader of... Any fucking nation has only gotten there by being boring. Be in love with war and vanilla on everything Yeah, else. you can't, you can't fucking, if it meant being transplanted, if it meant that someone sure, from the 70s sure. would make a better president in 2030, right. that would uh, be a completely different planet we yeah. live on. But the reality of the situation is the way to rule the world is be boring, yeah. beige, and agreeable. <laughs> See, I agree with you about that. I think uh, it's a very romantic idea that, oh, if I was only born in another time, but I don't think that really works. I mean, for the people who have these kind of, you know, we'll talk about the skills, Darkon, actually. Fuck it. Why don't we talk about that a little bit now? There are skills that Darkon takes. Yeah. There's analytical skills. Yeah. There are, I mean, they're the same skills you use in role playing, sure. resource management. The same kind of skills when they're figuring out, you know, their armor or their attack strategy. And those skills are translatable to things in the real world, but no more or less than in ye old medieval times. Right. <laughs> no more, I mean, maybe less. The thing that makes today a better age for these people is there's a community like Darkon. There's the internet. Sure. We have a better ability now, today, and in the future to do these things with each other, to find each other this way than we ever have before. But I think when he says, you know, oh, if I was only born centuries ago, I yeah. mean, it's part of the fantasy. Oh, yeah. Well, born centuries ago, you would... Die. Uh, yeah, you were right. 25. Uh, sure. There'd still be no elves, and you would probably be a slave. Yeah, I get this idea that it's still the football players who would be... The jocks would be the gladiators, you know? I mean, what do we know? There's, there's no fucking way to say. But the skill, I think the best way you can make a guess is by taking what skills do people who play Dark Onyx sell at and then going, what would those people be doing, you know, sure. back then? In the 80s, they'd be inventing computers. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, they'd be, they'd be making small businesses sure. for, you know, companies. Because now the market's so saturated in small business Yeah, from the people who had the ingenuity to put their analytical skills to figure out a sure. good business plan to use in 1986. Sure. So yeah, I think that's kind of an excuse. I would uh, I would agree with you on that. Well, yeah, and and I mean that's kind of something they touch on when they're talking about again, I think it's cardboard. Mm -hmm. Um or it's either cardboard or barren. Yeah. It's talking about the real world mentality and how in on earth, say, I guess that's sure. what we call it, right? On IRL earth versus on in real on. life. Yeah. Um it's all this competition and all this vying to be the best and sure. all this. You're identified by how many people you are better than. Sure. Say, take somebody like Justin Timberlake, better than everybody at everything. <laughs> um, wow, that's a bull. Where the so, fuck did that come from? <laughs> there's that level of superstardom and he gets all this prestige because 
you know that he is a particularly good social specimen. That's kind of this thing that the type of person who plays Darkon can achieve. Right. Because their skills don't resonate sure. on a public scale. Sure. sure. Um, somebody who's a great dad, somebody who can cook a mean dinner in 15 minutes. Right. You know, somebody who will sacrifice a part of their life and be a stay at home father, somebody who will be okay losing his family business sure and still be able to function on a sure. real level sure he's not going to be a celebrity right nobody really cares if you're a great father but goddamn if you're a funny singer dancer sure sure and that's kind of what they talk about in dark on is it's supposed to not be about being better than anybody and everybody's equal and it's you know it's back to that idea of equality that every fucking human and every fucking right, nation right. pretends they strive toward is sure. this, you know, everybody's equal. And if we can just maintain that level of equality for all people, sure. then there'd be no 99%. And right. communism would really work. Yeah. And communism is not a good idea on paper. It's a fucking <laughs> stupid idea on paper. I God, I hate that. Oh, it's like communism. Good idea on paper. Huh? No, fuck that. Yeah. Stupid idea on right. paper. You know what's a good idea on paper? Something that works in practice. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You mean a plan you draw yeah. out that you can then execute? Yeah. yeah that's a good fucking right. idea on paper. Yeah. Fuck you. Anyway, sorry. Um, but that's kind of what ends up happening, and that's a little bit of the conflict in Darkon, is that it's come down to the real world seeping into Darkon. Right. And you it can... is Cardboard who says that, because right. he's upset that everybody's picking on him in Darkon, yeah. that everybody kills his character, and he wanders out like, well, it's one of the few times you see Dark on anything less than just straight up champion. Yeah. You know, there's uh, there's these moments that bleed through when you get a real sense of how this is impacting people. Sure. For the most part, this is a great defense of Dark on. Yeah. And so it's natural for us to kind of tear down these people. But I think we we embrace them and their culture uh -huh. and their decision to just throw themselves headfirst into gaming. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's great. Immerse yourself in fantasy. Totally cool. But there are these moments that are the most fascinating ones to me where he kind of goes, you know, Darkon, for everything we've set it up to be, doesn't always work. It's sure. supposed to be this place that I go to where I am king and champion, but it is also a social structure right. and I'm still at the bottom exactly. of the, uh, the ladder sometimes. And then, and then there's the other things where Darkon creeps out of the real world and you see Baron and his friend go to Denny's. Yeah, right. And spend the entire night arguing about something that happened yeah. in game, but their friendship is on the line. Sure. And have you ever done or been around any kind of like role playing like that? I played D and D once. Sure. Yeah. Uh, our old producer used to play D and D and stuff uh -huh. too. Sometimes that happens. I've never really been into, you know, live action role play or whatever, but I've known a lot of people who've done it. And you have these kind of, you always question, you know, it comes up in the movie. Is this in character or out of character? Right. What are we doing right now? Well, I think you can tell it's out of character because Baron wouldn't go to Denny's. Well, yeah, you would think so. But they start having this argument and their mind works with fantasy so right. well that they can have an epic, you know, uh, war treaty debate in a Denny's and not realize their surroundings. You know, when you play D&D, &D, you fucking played it in your mom's basement. Right. Or you play it in your, uh, you know, your dorm room, sure. or you play it in your apartment. Where you play it is wherever you can be as far removed from the real world from as possible. From people who might find right. out you're playing D&D &D and make fun of you. not necessarily in the middle of the fucking forest. You're not, you're not shooting to be in the most medieval setting. Sure. You're looking to be in the most accepted setting, where sure. you're surrounded by, where the world can't get you. Sure, sure. I think the fact that they can have that argument in character and out of character and the line is blurred is, uh, you know, that's a great example of how the things from Darkon translate into right. the real world. Sure. Not just in specific one instance, you know, the, the fights people have or the disagreements or whatever, or where characters are talking about, you know, I have a romantic interest in Darkon, my girlfriend or whatever sometimes gets upset, doesn't sure. realize it's just a game. You know, the, those kind of carryovers. But also things like the skill set, the very things that make cardboard unlikable in the game uh -huh. that also make him unlikable out of game uh, or the things that make someone a success in the game. That's the place I really love Dark on is where you can see characters who are successful in Dark on are the ones who have embraced. Oh, there is a I didn't need to go back to medieval times. 
I can use these skills right now in my life and be successful. Things like public speaking. Yeah. I mean, we just, uh, you know, we talked already about how some people are great at acting in Darkon and some people are bad. And it's mostly improvised. And they have these, you know, they have these monologues all the time. And you could see who's good at public speaking from their monologues. The people who are good at giving monologues in Darkon can probably present a business proposal really well. They're good at thinking on their feet. The leaders in Darkon are probably great at team management, you know, in real life. They could probably get the right people together to do the right job and convince someone of a certain proposal in whatever kind of job they're mm-hmm. doing. But there's also, I mean, there's historical lessons you would learn from Darkon. There's, uh, it's the same thing as when you play any kind of real-time strategy game or you play Civilization or, sure. you know, these kind of things where it's nations making treaties uh, forming bonds based on kind of mutual interests. You know, you learn all of this through the exercise, war strategy and politics and uh, the person with the most land wins and allegiances. Yeah. When Baron has to kind of split off from that group and take his faction somewhere else, I mean, you, you've you seen that all the, yeah. all, all the fucking time historically yeah. in real life. And it teaches you what's going on in those people's heads at that moment. Mm -hmm. One, it attracts you to history a little bit more. It's a great thing for history teachers to take advantage of. uh, Because, two, it puts you in their place. You can kind of go, oh, now I see why, you know, this person invaded this country. You don't necessarily agree with them. But you could answer a question like, why are these countries at war? Oh, because one wants more land. That sure. seems stupid. What were these people if thinking? You're, yeah, what if was you're important? playing dark on, you could go, oh, yeah, that's stupid. But there was this one time I was trying to get these three hexes of land. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of see where yeah. they're coming from. Right. I, I at least know sometimes, that spot. Sometimes the land means, you know, more than just the actual fucking property. It means... Sure. It means spheres of influence, and it means sure. you know making a claim in the sure. world, and winning it, for your people. Yeah. you know, coming out as a leader that sure. has succeeded, and those are the moments that Darkon can teach you about, and some of the skills that it it can kind of help you grow. I mean, we haven't talked a lot about Keldar, the other uh, leader. I mean, the evil bad guy, who's <laughs> yeah, like totally not evil and part of the cool empire, guy. but yeah. knows that it's a game yeah. and that he's playing the empire guy and he's okay. And he seems like a nice enough guy yeah. in the interviews. Yeah. He, I really liked him. Yeah. He, um, he doesn't have that Billy Mitchell kind of mm-hmm. underhanded sneaky, you know, it, in being theatrical, the movie has to kind of paint him at the, as the bad guy, but I feel like he's a fine guy, yeah. you know, and he's someone who he talks a lot about one the movie shows that he's the most fucking successful guy in Darkon. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he talks a lot about how Darkon helped him develop these skills. He's yeah. very cognitive of that. That's not lost on him at all. You know, he, saw, he says in real life that he has gotten to the places he has gotten to. He's earned the confidence he has and developed these skills through playing Darkon. And those things are, you know, it's a great relationship. The better he gets at his real life skills, the more he can carry over to Darkon, the better he can play that game. Mm-hmm. And the more things he's, you know, he can do things like learn how to lead a team of people uh, years before he would ever have to do that at a, you know, at a job. Right. Maybe not quite the thing you'd put on a resume, but depending where you're working, maybe totally the thing you'd put on a yeah. resume. Baron, on the other hand, is the antithesis of that. He seems to blame the real world for all of his shortcomings. Sure. And as the, uh, as the movie ends, there's a vast number of people who, you know, just as I've bought into the hypothesis of Darkon can make you better, there's a lot of people who seem to have failed in their lives. Yeah. You know, we get the Baron depressed grocery shopping, you know, or uh, the woman talking about how she thought she'd be married and how she thought she'd have... She finally has her place... She's standing in her place, not going, I achieved this, but yeah. going, I thought I'd have kids by now. I thought yeah. I'd be married by now. Pointing out all of her, her shortcomings. When we talked uh, on our show about Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, we talked about not hating what you do. Right. And these people have Darkon kind of as a retreat. Some of them use it to better themselves. Some of them have it purely as an alternative to their own shitty lives, Mm -hmm. to their, you know, their Starbucks or Hot Topic manager existence. 
Do you think that's to be praised? I mean, is it an okay idea to check out of reality and embrace fantasy to the extent that your real life, you've just given up and it's terrible and it'll always be terrible, but you'll always have dark on? I don't know. I honestly, I can't fault anybody for choosing their own reality. Sure. Who am I to tell anybody it's better than just hating your reality that's yeah, for sure right that's yeah uh, would, and there are there are that. people who spend fucking weeks of their life playing second life sure you know they have a second life wife and a second life house and a second life job sure. and fucking whatever you know honestly i like the notion that you can choose a new reality if sure the current one you're in seems hopeless sure but i think that i mean and this is me personally yeah. I'm always going to be the type that goes hopeless, huh? Well, let's see about that. Yeah, right. I like that. Yeah. There is, you know, it's better than drugs and it's better yeah. than alcohol and it's better than doing nothing. And it's creative and it exercises certain muscles. Sure. So I don't think it's, it's not terrible. No, but it's dangerous because the more people that check out of the world, the less of the world is checked into the world. That's true. And I, I love when people can turn that around and can go... I'm going to use Darkon to make things better. I feel like that's those are the people who've really won Darkon. Yeah. Those are the people who win the game is the people who go, maybe I got into this because I was interested or maybe I got in it because my life was terrible, but I used it to kind of rehabilitate myself. Yeah. And to be able to stay immersed in fantasy and then check back into reality like it's no big deal is fucking hard. And those yeah. people should be commended for it. I agree. All right, so the website is doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, we said a lot of uh, really heavy stuff on this show that people can <laughs> totally disagree with. Probably, and please do. Doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Love to talk to you all about that. Unless the uh, John Carpenter isn't really something something you said, but is actually, the, I don't care about that. Yeah. But the Darkon stuff, yeah. totally. Yeah, let me know <laughs> how you feel about uh, all of that. Love that we somehow also had an entire episode talking about a game. Yeah. Was, or at least half an episode, and that makes makes me feel pretty good. Love gaming culture. Love people yeah. who play games. I have such a soft spot for the people who immerse themselves in a fantasy world, even if, by definition, they have to fail at reality to yeah. do it. I just, man, those are, I love those people. Champion those people. Um, what are we doing next time on the show? We're going to do two Philip K. Dick features, a Philip K. Dick double feature. Oh, this a is double dick good. feature I, starring oh, Ben Affleck in Paycheck and Nicolas Cage in Next. Watch more fucking film. Bye.